The Night Shift is brought to you by Bob Moran, Ian Berry, Link Introductions, and Lynn Andrews Real Estate. The events you're about to see and hear are true. Real cops, real cases, real criminals. Stories told by the cops who lived them and will remember them the rest of their lives. Talk Cops. Have you ever had a premonition something bad's going to happen? And then so as to not give in to superstition, you just ignore it. Being in a high-risk profession, a lot of police officers frequently get those feelings and try to forget them. But still, there's one time I wish I'd heeded a premonition. It was a Memorial Day weekend. I had to work, and my wife, who has asthma, was not feeling well. The next day, I was taking her for some special treatment in Atlanta. <coughs> So you want to leave tomorrow when? About uh, 8, 9 o'clock? That'll be fine. My bags are all packed. I don't need all that much, I guess. <coughs> you okay? I'll be fine. Maybe I better call Dean, tell him I can't make it. Don't be silly. If it gets worse, the phone's right there. There's something else bothering you, isn't there? No, no, not at all. Look, I'll, uh, I'll try to get off early. Hmm? I'll, uh, I'll call you when I know for sure. I was concerned about Sharon and the hospital procedure she was facing. <coughs> but that really wasn't my main worry. All day long, I'd had this nagging feeling that just wouldn't go away. A feeling that something real bad was about to happen. I started my shift at 4 o'clock, cleaned up some paperwork, and was talking with Susan, nope. our dispatcher, when the lieutenant came in. Dean, can I uh, have a word? Sure. So, uh, how's Sharon? Well, this uh, asthma doesn't get any better. We're taking her down to Atlanta tomorrow. The hospital unit there is going to uh, flush her lungs out. Boy, that sounds rough. Yeah. Well, uh, you give her my best now. Yeah, thanks, Dean. I'll, I'll do that. You know, Dean, her spirits are good, but... Uh, what? Well, I'll be honest with you, Dean. I don't want to work tonight. I mean, maybe it's just worrying about Sharon and all, you know, but uh, I'd like the evening off. Bob, I'd like to, but I can't. Memorial Day weekend? I need every available vehicle on the road. Yeah, well, I understand. Come on, get you a cup of coffee and make you feel better. Yeah, good. You know, Dean, I'm 52 years old now. Mm -hmm. Got 29 years on. I could retire any time now. You thinking about doing that? <laughs> well, I don't know. I woke up this morning with this feeling that if I don't retire, I'm going to get killed out there. Come on, Bob. Can't think about things like that. Still, would be something, wouldn't it? Hmm? What's that? Well, getting shot out there when I could be sitting on a beach someplace. You're gonna be fine. You have a nice routine shift. Take Sharon up to Atlanta in the morning. Now, come on. Have some of that coffee. If that don't kill you, nothing will. <laughs> I called up Sharon and told her I'd be home at midnight. Then I headed out for highway patrol. Normally, as a supervisor, I'd be riding with a younger trooper, giving guidance and so forth. But on holiday weekends, we get all the cars on the road. So I was by myself. I still had this funny feeling I couldn't shake, but I only had an hour to go. A half mile away, two other men were getting a funny feeling of their own. But Brandon Peck and Wayne Logan were getting theirs from alcohol. <laughs> like I said, I spent nearly 20 years in that stinking joint. That's like half my damn life. You're way ahead of me, man. I'm gonna done fine. Yeah, well, I'm out now. I'm on parole and I'm gonna fly. <laughs> gonna fly! <laughs> Put this thing in 
were driving erratically, coming to the attention of two off-duty security guards, Rick Carell and William North. The two guards pulled off at my post and gave a description of the car to Sue Welch. Call in 73. At 11.17, Trooper Scott Borden and I got the call from Sue. Uh, 758. 758, we have a code 19 heading south on Route 23. Brown Buick, Ohio plates. Kilroy, Delta Peter, 283. It's reported veering over the road. I was over on the north side of the highway, so I pulled onto the median and waited less than a minute. Suspect vehicle has uh, stopped 23 north of uh, Old Scarada Road. 758, got another report on Kilroy Delta Peter, 283. Tags have been stolen. Okay. At this point, I didn't feel it was too serious. Sometimes tags get lost and a computer registers them as stolen. Still, you can never be too careful. Come on, we're not gonna blow him away, man. Shut up. What's your problem? He's just one cop. Okay. Turn off the motor, roll down the window. Give me your driver's license and registration, please. Driver, turn off the motor. Roll down the window. Is this what you want? I'd had some extra firearm training recently, and I know it enabled me to get those two shots off. At this point, though, I had no idea if either bullet had connected. My chest was hurting real bad, and I thought I bought it this time. Watch him! Watch him! You're crazy, man! We're gonna die! Shut up! I'll do you, too! I thought about trying to make it back to the cruiser, I had a shotgun there, but couldn't figure how I'd jack a shell in the chamber with just one arm. His hands and face were bloody, so I thought, well, I've done a little good, but I was really worried about the other guy. I figured he was probably gonna come at me from behind, in a situation like this, you're trained to count your shots. I figured I now had only one bullet left. I'd lost a lot of blood and the pain was so intense that I was sure I was mortally wounded. But I felt if I'm dying, I'm arresting him first. I'm going to give you one more chance. Now you throw your gun out. I'm hurt. 
through that you're gonna out. All right. Now, you step out of the car. Don't you bet. Knee down. Put your hands on your head. I have uh, one suspect in custody. Uh, one suspect is loose. Okay, hold on. Backup should be there any second. By this point, I could barely keep myself from passing out. Deputy Sheriff Paul Bloomfield was the first to arrive. Hey, you. You hurt me real bad. You hurt me pretty bad, too. A minute later, the security guards and Trooper Scott Borden pulled up. Listen, Holby, if I die, that guy that shot me. What the hell is this country coming to? I was just walking along the road, some cop pulls up and shoots me. More backup arrived and took the shooter away. As they searched for the second man, they loaded me in the ambulance. Oh. Hey, Lieutenant. Uh, Bob, uh, I'm gonna get Sharon and bring her to the hospital. You better be uh, careful how you tell her now. I don't want her going into asthmatic shock. Yeah, don't worry. I'm gonna tell her it's just your elbow. Yeah. Guess I, uh, I should have given you the night off, huh? <laughs> Guess I... I better, better learn not to ignore premonitions, huh? They transferred me to a specialist in Columbus, and cruisers from every jurisdiction turned out along the highway as the ambulance went by. It was like an honor guard some 80 miles long. One thing surprised me afterwards. When they checked my revolver, they found it was empty. I'd miscounted my shots. Somehow, though, I'd managed to arrest a dangerous offender using one arm and an empty gun. I'm an agent with the GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. GBI is a law enforcement agency that assists police departments and sheriff's offices throughout the state. We conduct investigations that are requested by the governor's office, a superior court judge, or any of the DAs or other state agencies. I was assigned to the GBI's Region 10 office, which is in Conyers, Georgia, a growing suburban area 30 miles east of Atlanta. From that office, we covered all of the metro Atlanta counties. In late July of 1988, a missing person case in Atlanta was getting a lot of media attention. It concerned a woman named Julie Love, who had disappeared on the night of July 11th. There were few solid leads, and the Atlanta Police Department was becoming increasingly frustrated by the lack of progress being made in the case, and by the growing pressure from the public to solve it. The case was of particular interest to me because Julie Love and I were similar in many ways. We were the same age, both the youngest child in the family. We lived in the same area and had similar lifestyles. I could sympathize with her family because I knew how mine would feel if that had happened to me. More flyers? Yeah. That boyfriend of hers is a real media whiz. Got the whole town in on it. Flyers, t-shirts, billboards. Marketing exec, he's a pro. Yeah. Did you see him on TV last night? Yeah, I thought he did a good job. Spoke well. Yeah, real smooth. Not like a guy whose fiance just disappeared. He was on the radio this morning. Three different stations. Playing a big rally over at Piedmont Park on Sunday. That guy doesn't sleep, does he? Maybe he can't. Just wants his baby back. Something about David Jaffe bothered me. So I decided to take a look at him on my own time. You all know the name. You can all see the face. A face so full of energy. I went so to the rally out of curiosity, 
to get a better look at Jaffe Someone and see what kind of people were working with him. Is. But I knew that sometimes a person who commits this type of crime will participate in the searches and other organized now, activities. But everyone but here seemed to know each other. Enough. They were a real close-knit group. The only one who looked out of place was me. Whoever knows where she is, just let her come home. Please. If you have her somewhere, just let her go. Thank you. Like I said, it wasn't my case. I was just personally touched by it. But the very next day, the Atlanta Police Department requested our help with the investigation. I didn't have that much experience, and generally, a case with this much publicity wouldn't have fallen to me. But Agent Ector understood how much I identified with Julie Love. The family's getting frustrated. Atlanta PD's not making any progress, so the chief has asked us to step in and see what we can do. Well, who will I be working with over there? Missing person detective C.D. Potter. No, I mean, uh, from here, who will I be assisting? No one. It's your county. It's your case. You handle it. Detective Porter, Nita Weston, GBI. Oh, glad to meet you. I see you. I, I can really use your help. Are you the only one in the case? And I'm this close to being buried under it. Anything you need, just ask. Well, first, I'd like to see everything you got so far. This ought to get us started. Porter had done quite a bit of work on this case for one detective. He'd conducted searches. Her car had been recovered and processed for evidence. He'd done neighborhood canvases, interviewing everyone and following up every possible lead. Let me run through this, see if I got the sequence right. July 11th, Julie Love's last day. Julie was seen swimming at her health club during the day. And later she went for a manicure. She just spent a lovely weekend in Florida with her boyfriend, David. How long have they been together? Three years. And over that last weekend, he finally made a commitment to marry her. And she was looking forward to shopping for a wedding dress. And that night, she attended a group counseling session, which ended at around 9.30 p.m. and then went to a movie. I'm going to go, you guys. OK? OK. See ya. Take care now. Yeah, soon she ran out of gas on the way to Jaffe's house. The car was abandoned in his neighborhood. No one's seen her since. It's like she just dropped off the face of the earth. Yeah, too much time's gone by. If she took off on her own or with someone, she should have contacted somebody by now. Friends, family, somebody. Strange for her to take off, too. Especially after her boyfriend finally proposes to her. Somebody grabbed her. We came to the conclusion that Julie Love had been abducted. We tried to determine if it was someone she knew or a stranger. We went back over the file with a fine tooth comb, checking and rechecking every piece of information. We began re-interviewing everyone, thinking that maybe something or someone had been overlooked. On the night of July. We started with her boyfriend, David Jaffe. As an investigator, the first people you suspect are the people closest to the victim. It's nothing personal, just regular investigative thinking. Start with the people closest and work your way out. The process of elimination. You kill Julie Love? No. He passed. As far as I can tell, he's telling the truth about everything. Thanks. I still don't trust the guy. He checked out clean. His fiance's missing. You'd think he'd be an emotional wreck or devastated. I mean, how can he function? How can he be so calm? A lie detector doesn't mean anything to somebody without a conscience. We talked to family members and friends, both Julie's and Jaffe's, trying to get a composite of their relationship. But we never found any evidence of physical or verbal abuse. Eventually, we had to rule him out as the prime suspect. Well, I hope you understand, Mr. Jaffe. It's nothing personal. Miss Weston, if you weren't this thorough, I wouldn't want you looking for Julie. Well, I hope we find her. Me too. But it doesn't look good, does it? What 
you got for him? Messages. Everybody want to help. Somebody spotted a boy in the plane. This one says she in London. This one says she had a burger joint in Savannah. Probably with Elvis. Here's one from a psychic. Call ASAP, had vision of Julie Love. We just spoke to FBI. If someone took Julie over state lines, it involves them, so they're assigning someone to help out. That's great. Yeah. I also spoke to Julie's family. They're trying to keep it together, but I don't know how they can stand it day after day, not knowing. You still holding out hope? Well, as long as there's no body found, I guess there's always a chance. In April of 1989, a convict locked up in another county admitted to the authorities that he had some information on the case. We went out to question him, hoping that we finally had a lead. His name was James Richard Connor, and he had an extensive criminal record. So, yeah. Anyway, I saw her on the street, and like I said, I picked her up and raped her and killed her. What'd you do with the body? Took her up to North Georgia. Bad up in the mountains. Real remote. I've killed other girls too, you know. And I get the urge that I just can't control myself. If you want me to believe you, you're gonna have to show me where you buried her. Sure. But I'll be needing another pack of cigarettes. Everything Connor told us sounded feasible. He was familiar with the area Julie was from, and burying her in North Georgia would explain why we hadn't found anything in Atlanta. Nita, this place is clean. Maybe we should move on down and try another spot. No, we already searched half the state. So what do you think? I think this jerk's been lying to us, which puts us back to square one, which is nothing. Time was dragging on without results. The FBI assigned Special Agent John Binky to assist us. We followed up every lead, talked to every person we could, but still we were getting nowhere. It got to the point where, as far as some of the other investigators were concerned, the case would never be solved. But I wanted to stick with it as long as I could. As long as I had something to work on, I worked it. And then finally, 13 months after Julie Love's disappearance, we got a break. Weston, the hub order. All right, I'll be right over. We just got a Fulton County police report. A woman named Olivia Chase just swore a complaint against a man named Arliss Sawyer for pistol whipping her. She says she knows some of the people that he's killed. Says she saw him do it. Julie Love? That's right. Come on, Porter. Nearly every woman whose boyfriend beats up on her claims that he's the one that killed Julie Love. Yeah, but none of them know the kind of details this one does. Go ahead, check it out. She describes what Julie is wearing right down to the diamond stud earrings. And why didn't she come forward before? She and Sawyer went to drugs together, but Olivia wouldn't let him smoke crack in her apartment in front of her kids. So he beats up on her and threatens to kill her. And then she talks. We pulled his criminal record, and he's pretty violent. It fits the profile. History of abductions and robberies. Well, where's Sawyer now? They got him locked up because of the complaint. The following morning, Detective Porter, another GBI agent, Lisa Harris, and I went to talk with Olivia, who lived under the flight path to Atlanta International Airport. Miss Chase? Miss Chase? What the hell are you knocking on my door? What time is it? Miss Chase, we're from the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The what? The police. What you want? Waking me up, scaring me half to death? What time is it? Miss Chase, we're here to talk to you about the complaint you filed on Arliss Sawyer. Already told that cop everything. <laughs> Thank you. 
Miss Chase! We'd like to talk about the information you gave on Julie Love. Forget it. Banging on my door, waking my babies. I, I got nothing to say to you. Look, you're the one who filed the complaint. You gave us this information. Now you're going to have to follow through on it, all right? N nobody believes me. Why should I tell it again? Is this your statement? Is it the truth? Yeah. Well, we believe you. Isn't that good enough? I believe you. If you help us, we can protect you. And so you won't be able to hurt you again. I promise you that. You'll get out of jail. He always do kill people for less than that. I've seen him. If you cooperate with us, he won't get out of jail, ever. He'll be in there the rest of his life. We know you're afraid. We're not trying to trick you. We'll put him away for good. Julie Love was somebody's child. Now, every night, her mother wonders where she is. Is she hurt? Does she cry out for help? I mean, as a mother, surely you can imagine what it feels like to not know what's happened to your child? Will you help us? Help us find her and take her home. <laughs> We were cruising Buckhead. Alice was looking for somebody to roll. Kevin was driving the car. It must have been about midnight when we spotted him. Look at here. Hi. Can we give you a ride? No, thank you. I live over here. to get the money, but she gave us the wrong numbers. Both machines kept the cards. She gave us the wrong numbers. She lied. Bitch! No! No, I couldn't. You must have got 
got to fix it up. What do we do? One thing left to do. Kevin took around the building and raped her. That's when I told him I wanted out. We argued. He dropped me off. I asked Arliss what he was going to do to her. He said, don't worry about it. Did Julie say anything? She asked me not to leave her with him. So you say what he was going to do after that?